All right, this afternoon's presentation is going to be surrounding Soho routers. What do we mean by we when we say Soho? The small office or home office. These are typically going to be your very localized small devices. When you're talking about routers for a Soho sense, it's typically these all-in-one devices where you have the router, the switch, the WAP, and all that is in a singular device versus an enterprise level where each of these devices are their own individual units. We're also going to be talking about wireless protocols, setting up wireless routers, getting into things like, you know, the frequencies that we are going to be um, transmitting on, what kind of channels we use, why we use these channels. We're going to be talking about wireless security, starting our first little touches of the security aspects and getting into all the various wireless protocols that we use, what makes them unique, and generationally, how did they come about? So throughout this technical session, we're gonna be talking about comparing and contrast internet connection types and features, compare and contrast Wi-Fi networking standards and encryption types, explain the role of a router and describe the difference between a wired and wireless router. Also describe how to install, configure and deploy a Soho router, identify common pitfalls and talk about some common solutions. Behavior, skills, and mindsets we want to keep in mind. Communication, IT is a team sport. So keeping in communication with your teams effectively, it will be critical to the health of your team and also communicating with your managers as well as your customers in an effective manner. Essentially, we will be speaking three different languages, one to our customer, one to our teammates, and one to our managers. Understand your managers don't necessarily aren't necessarily gonna know more than you about IT. Their goal is to manage resources, not necessarily be able to teach you how to do your job. Your teammates are gonna be most closely linked to you in your verbiage. <clears throat> so you will talk to them in much more of a technical sense and customers, you will use more layman's terms in order to effectively communicate what's going on without overburdening them with vocabulary and acronyms and things of that nature. And persistence, we must maintain persistence when in the pursuit of troubleshooting and solving problems. If we give up on a problem, it's not gonna get solved. If we hand off that problem, we should follow up on it because then if we know what solutions were implemented to solve that problem, the next time we see it, we can do the same thing, adding greater value to us for our team. All right, what is the internet? Such an ominous term. It's basically a global system of networks that links billions of computers for communicating, sharing information and resources. For a while there, it was kind of the wild, wild west. Unfortunately, it is becoming far more centralized, although there are efforts to kind of decentralize it yet again, ergo Fediverse, things like that. And then there are efforts trying to centralize it even more, the metaverse for Facebook. For the most part, it <clears throat> consists of millions of private, public, academic, business, and government networks linked by broad array of electronic, wireless, and optical networking technologies. Physically, the internet is a huge TCP IP based network, as we just discussed TCP IP in our previous one, utilizing a physical mesh technology. Remember we talked about the largest mesh network is the internet, because it's nodes being connected through many, many pathways all over the network, creating a huge mesh that surrounds the entire globe. If one of these nodes goes down, the internet quickly finds a way to move around these nodes because there are multiple connections to every point. Traffic's 
passes through these complex systems trying to find the most efficient both, both by time and by number of routers it needs to uh, go through to reach its final destination. And it all happens automatically. So types of internet connections that can be established. You have your old trusty dial up. If any of us, you know, some of you out there may not have enough seasons under your belt to remember a computer screaming at you before it went on the internet. But for those of us back in that day, it's dark times. It could take you a day or two to load a single image, single picture. You know how hard it was to share memes back in that day? So dial up, extremely slow. Then we moved through the technologies a little bit more. We had our ISDNs, or Integrated Service Digital Network, DSLs, cable TV, fiber optic being the fastest we have to date. And then we had some Wi-Fi or wireless systems. We have our satellite. It was great for, you know, if you're out in an area where they didn't, you know, run the telephone lines or and all that stuff out there as easily. Problem was high latency. So if you're doing things like gaming, video conferencing, stuff like that, it made things rather difficult. You have your cellular G level 4G LTE now kind of evolving into that 5G technology. 5G will make cellular <clears throat> very competitive with its wired counterparts, with probably the notable exception to fiber optic. And we have Wi Fi Max, Wi Fi, and tethering for, or also including mobile hotspots in this. Wired connections. First one to talk about dial up. It's the least expensive of all of them for very good reason. Absolute and utter slowest communication. I think at its max, you're looking at 56 kilobytes or kilobits, excuse me, 56 kilobits per second. Extremely slow. Uh, loading web pages takes a long time. Streaming, completely out of the question. Music, not so much. It may take you five, 10 minutes to download a single song. Uses uh, travel. If you're at, you know, at a hotel or something like that, you could dial into your networks if you choose. Your broadband is down, you're saving money. If you're in older areas, dial up maybe one of your only options outside of satellite. Um, some people may use something like this as a backup. If you're utilizing this, the computers use modem cards, which provided two phone jacks or RJ11. Uh, and they utilize the twisted pair with the four wires going through it. So you had two pairs that were twisted. <clears throat> and it is not the same technology as DSL, which also goes over phone lines. Next, ISDN, or Integrated Services Digital Network. It is a digital telephone technology that supports multiple 64 kbps, or kilobits per second channels, known as B, on a signal connection. It has the comp compatibility to carry voice, video, or data over phone. Physical connection is through the RJ45 cable and a modem called a terminal adapter or TA. ISDN circuits are classified as basic rate interface and primary rate interface. So this is one of the first instances where you could quite literally carry phone data and voice over the same line. They do break this down in the book as well. I believe it is chapter eight. Next, DSL, digital subscriber line. 
high-speed data transitioning over existing telephone wiring. Now, in order to make this happen, interestingly, they shortened the wavelength of which your voice could carry over the phone. So when you hear somebody's voice over an old phone line, you actually don't hear the full range of their voice. They shorten the wavelength that was possible in order to transmit data over the higher and lower sounds where we typically cannot hear. And they have two, basically, two different types of DSL with regards to data usage. And that is asynchronous digital subscriber line and synchronous digital subscriber line. And what they're talking about is your upstream speeds and your downstream speeds. Synchronous DSL, your upstream and downstream are the same. So if you're, you know, if you're streaming up at about, you know, three megs a second, you would be streaming down at three megs a second. It is identical both directions of the stream. Asynchronous typically puts a heavier emphasis on download and lower emphasis on upload. You may notice if you run speed tests on your computer, it'll say you, you get like 80 megs down and 20 megs up. So you're, it's, it's asynchronous. Your download speeds are much faster than your upload speeds because we are not pushing data up very often. We're typically pulling it down for the majority of the part. Streaming, uh, cable TV, you know, even going to websites, you know, all that stuff. The majority of the information is coming downstream to us, not upstream back to the internet. So that is where asynchronous comes into play. So you get the same bandwidth, but the majority of it is dedicated coming to you. Cable internet uses, this is one of the most common ones out there today, uses existing cable lines. It's always connected, always up. TV signals and PC signals share the same coaxial cable coming into your house. And the cable modem itself converts the PC digital signals into analog so that they can go back out over the lines. Questions so far? All right, fiber optic. There's no line sharing typically with fiber optic. Could be multiple signals, short distance, or single mode laser light with high transfer rates over long distance. Television, internet data, and voice communication. Although recent um, alterations in the last 10 years now allow us to use the same line in both directions, even if it's single, uh, single channel or single mode, they found a way to actually run the signals both ways, which is really nice. lowers their infra infrastructure cost by half on that. Wireless communications. Satellite, one of the first ones. Satellite connection is option for many places if you're in a very remote location or utilizing, you know, setting up a WAN, your maximum download at this time it is different now it's much higher now starlink is actually looking to be a very promising technology we'll see how it evolves when more people get online but currently it seems to be pretty promising at the moment max download 125 megabytes max upload three megabytes that's extremely slow not to mention how far the communications have to go before they're responded. Like, so if I'm talking into a satellite, it has to go to my satellite dish, be transmitted miles up into the air until it hits a satellite. That satellite then transit miles back down to the ground to where it's supposed to go. And then it travels through a wired network to get to that final computer and then has to come all the way back again. It creates a delay in the signal. That delay we call latency. Even on some of the best satellite uh, communications, you're looking at two to three seconds delay minimum. You might have seen this on the news where like the, the newscaster is talking to somebody in the field and then there's like a three to five second delay before they seem to respond to any questions. 
And it's because of the latency in the signal, the delay in the signal. The other big problem is, is it's sensitive to weather conditions. If you have heavy overcast, if you have a lot of foliage, you know, around your house, trees, anything that can pass in front of that signal will cause attenuation or just, you know, a degrading of that signal. So heavy cloudy, heavy cloudy days, you're not going to get great reception. Your, your transfer speeds are going to be significantly diminished. If any of you ever had Dish Network and tried to watch a football game during a, you know, a bad storm, doesn't work out so good. All right, cellular <clears throat> requires a cellular service provider, big dogs in the industry. You got Verizon, AT&T, and Xfinity. And it has kind of evolved over various technology. You had first gen, which used analog data, US bet on analog. Um, it allowed for broader transmission, higher throughput, things like that. Worked out great, lower power usage. The rest of the world went digital and we needed to catch up. So we actually converted back over to digital and had to rebuild our entire infrastructure around it for 2G, use GSM technology. 3G uses GPRS and Edge. You don't really need to know the details of, of Gen 1, 2, and 3. For the most part, it's mostly just definitional. Gen 4 is when things really started to evolve. We start getting into LTE, which is short for long-term evolution of the technology. In theory, you could achieve up to 300 megabits per second downloading and 75 megabits per second uploading. Me personally, I've never experienced anything close to that on my phone, but in theory, based off the technology, this is what it's capable of. 5G, <clears throat> which is just now starting to get a footprint in the US, has the theoretical compatibility, you know, compatibility of 10 gigabits per second download with extremely low latency. Now, even if we could just get a quarter of that, 2.5 gigabits per second, that is insanely fast for a phone. So even if we you know, only get 25% of that maximum, that is awesome. But that is a budding technology right now. It is not fully implemented. The infrastructure is currently being built for this questions so far. So can you please go back to the previous slide? Yes. Go ahead, Karen. Why is everybody so um, up in arms about 5G? What's the, what's the big, I mean, I hear like, I guess around town, they're putting up the towers for the mm. 5G and Everybody it happens. Uh, I mean, there's there's the legitimate versus the illegitimate with the regards to this. Conspiracy theory type. Yeah, stuff. and yeah. the thing is, is these these conspiracy theories they're not new. They've been around forever. They were around when analog was first being put up. They came okay. out when when one you know when two G was coming up. About the time the technology evolves, these same theories come up. Like you know, the radio signals will cause cancer in your brain and. Right, and all right. of this stuff. And yeah, there are people out there that are actually sensitive to these type, the, the signals. <clears throat> hmm. But that is like literally one in 10 million people. So, you know, you may not want to live in a big city if you're one of these people. Right. Because wireless signals are kind of unfortunately everywhere all the time right now. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of this stuff does spring up. I mean, there is some questions with regards to like, them being able to monitor data, they're able to gather metadata on you at a much faster rate and a much more accurate rate, things like that. And there are some uh, good foundations for those concerns. But that's with every technology, there's the convenience versus security. You'll hear me mention that all the time. The yeah. greater convenience you gain, the less security you have. So you need to find what's comfortable for you with regards to how much 
information you're going to let be out there and how much security you're going to give up versus the level of convenience you want in your life. Yeah. So, okay. okay. Yes, Cynthia. Yeah, um, just to add to Karen, I'll send you guys um, some uh, actual footage from uh, British and American naval intelligence officers. And it's, it is it is a health risk. It doesn't really matter if you're congested in a big city. It doesn't really matter because, I mean, there are people that could be in a place where it's congested but have a, a super duper immune system versus a person that be, could be in a very like mid-sized to uh, basically open field um, and still get sick. So it's kind of sort of, um, they explain that it is warfare. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the military, both in the British front and the American front, but, okay. Um, yeah, well, I mean, they it, do it use... is a, it, it's, it's us where, I mean, I mean, I try to get too deep into this, but I've done research for a very long time. And this is a field that I'm really interested in, but it is a health hazard regardless. It, I, I'm just keeping it real moving forward we're, okay. we're literally dealing with frequencies that we have no understanding but they do and they've used it on and they've used it on people well in the Vietnam War we had very little understanding of microwave when they were using that yeah, for communications and awesome. people got nuked internally from that yeah. with because of the lack of understanding so as it as it evolves we get to understand it better some are higher are much higher sensitive to it than others exactly but. That's what I'm saying. It's a, it's a health hazard period. It doesn't really matter how, it's, there's no sweet talking and say it's not healthy or it is healthy, it's just unhealthy and I'm just keeping it real. We'll see how it evolves. All right, any other questions? All right. Next. So this is kind of a quick summary of the intro to network, networking, uh, various networks you have. This is a wireless version of it. You have your PAN, your WLAN, your MANs, and your WAN. And then in here, you'll see this IEEE and then the 802 dot something here. These are essentially the standards that are associated with those particular types of networks. It's basically to, for it to be considered in these networks, they have literally these, these networks, these uh, standards that you can literally just look up on the internet and it tells you what everything that works in this has this list of standards. It's like three ring binders full of information, you know, for it to be incorporated in this. For this particular one, we are going to be focusing on the wireless LAN, the Wi-Fi range, which is the 802.11. Uh, that is the main one we will be looking at for this technical session. Other ones that you, we will deal with more in this course is the 802.15, but you don't need to know that, which is the Bluetooth technology. This larger, the man and the WAN stuff, they will talk about that more in Network Plus. A Plus is much more heavily focused on the wireless LAN, 802.11. But I like how this kind of represents it where it shows you the PAN is the littlest and then it ever expands into the WAN. All right, tethering. It may, wireless tethering may be branded as a mobile hotspot, but basically what tethering is, is, is a single device sharing its internet connection with another. Mobile hotspot will allow you to do it with many. Wired tethering would typically be a single cable from your phone into your computer. Uh, that was one of the early stages of wireless um, communications with laptops. You could utilize your, your data signal from your cell phone, plug it into your laptop, work quite wonderfully unless you received a phone call, in which case it would cut off your internet to accept that phone call. Thankfully, they've updated it. It doesn't quite do that anymore, but we can use our phones as a tether for our other mobile devices if we wish, or create a hotspot for multiple devices. They also have individual devices like we talked about uh, for intro to networking. 
Uh, Verizon, I believe, has one. It's called a Jetpack. It's a little hockey puck looking thing. It's got like two buttons on it. Turn it on and uh, information or something like that. And uh, basically, it is one device sharing its internet communication with another. All right. <clears throat> the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electronic and Elect Electrical and Electronics Engineers. These are the people who come up with all the standards for the various things that we have. There are hundreds of these things. Typically, you're only going to be looking them up and dealing with them if it is relevant to your job. There are some basic ones you need to know and understand where you need to go to find this information. But like we said, with regards to the A+, it is heavily focused on the 802.11 most of the others are ignored. They will talk about those in higher certifications like Network Plus, CCNA, things like that. You'll need to know more about the other standards, but for the purposes of A plus, 802.11 is where it's at. All right, LAN standards. So we have Ethernet, which is the most popular networking standard. It is logically a bus, physically a star, ring, or hybrid. It can be wired or wireless, and it can use copper wire or Wi-Fi. And then over off to the side, you might recognize some of these. These were the standards we were talking about of the various types of wires. I would take special note of thick net and thin net. Can anybody tell me what those are associated with? What type of physical technology? Yes, Cynthia. What was your question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Well, I'll take special note of thick net and thin net over oh, here. Yeah. This is 1002 base two and 1002 base five. What technology does that surround? What physical technology would you see those over? Uh, the thin net is actually for like the server. So you're connecting to the server. Um, and the thick net is like, so like thin net is like, um, like low if any like applications. And then like the, so you find that like in like a data center and then like the 10 base five thick net is like your basic applications. Like, um, you know. Uh, I think you're thinking of thick client versus thin client. Ah, you're right. You're right. That's exactly. So that's that's so. Yeah. So the so you're saying what technology? Uses... Thick net versus thin net. What technology is this running on? So this is, uh, Rachel. Uh, the coax. What was it? Coax. You are correct. It is coaxial. That is our coaxial uh, standards. If you ever see thick net or thin net, that should instantly trigger you towards coaxial. So if you're being asked a question with regards to UTP or STP, unshielded versus shielded twisted pair, and you see thick net or thin net show up in there, you know instantly that does not fit. <clears throat> so thick net, thin net, that is your coax. Yes, Cynthia. So for so is are both of them thin net and thick net both uh, uh, interchangeably use uh, the UTP and STP both of them or is it like thin net is just UTP and then like thick net and thin net have no twisted pair that is coaxial cable that is a single piece of copper running down a wire okay so it's just the coaxial so that's yeah okay. All right. thin net is like your RJ was it forty eight not RJ forty eight uh, the RG 48, that's the cable that runs outside along the power lines. That's your thick net. Your thin net is where it converts over to the, no, so RG8 is the, the extra one. That's the, the lower number is the thicker gauge. And then the higher number, the RG48, that is the thin wire that comes into your house. Say that, that is your yeah. thick net versus your thin net. I'm confused. I, I didn't get that quite just right. You said the thick net is your coaxial. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, they're both coaxial. But remember, right. there were different standards of coax. Right. So your thin net is the RG48, or is that the thick net? 
your thin net is going to be the RG48. Your oh. thick net is going to be like the RG8. Got it. So the lower number is a thicker gauge on the wire. That's your thick net. It's a thicker wire. It's much, okay. much, you know, firmer. The higher number is the thin net. It's a much thinner wire, lower gauge or lower thickness, smaller thickness. All right. So then we got our Ethernet, our 100 and 1000 base T's for fast Ethernet versus gigabit. And then our wireless technologies, which we have our 802.11, A, B, G, N, and AC. Don't worry, we'll become very familiar with those in just a minute. All right. So wired gives you the strongest connection. Wired will always be faster than wireless. Wherever possible, if you need really good, strong, stable connections, wired is always going to be your option. Also considered within the wired, even though it doesn't have wires, would be your single mode fiber versus your multi-mode fiber. Also remember, multi-mode is your short run. Single mode is your long runs with regards to fiber optics. Wireless and mobility, you have your Wi-Fi for your typical like room area, like size of a, like a room. No. You have Bluetooth, which would be for your pans. So like your, your keyboards, your mouses, your, your, your headphones, things like that. And then you have your infrared, which is, as we know, a legacy technology that is being outdated. It's extremely slow. It's sensitive to bright lights and it has a maximum uh, transfer of, I believe it's nine meters. Let me know when you're good, Jill. All right. So, wired versus wireless. Wi-Fi characteristics, wireless ethernet. It's a network uses radio signals or radio waves to communicate. Wireless networks used today are based off the IEEE 802.11 ethernet standard marketed as Wi-Fi. This is where the largest growth in networking has occurred over the last 10 years. How to make this more efficient, how to make it have faster throughput, how to get us longer range. Largest growth over the last 10 years. Understanding Wi-Fi characteristics Installation and configuration is essential for every network technician and administrator. All right. Now, In the 2.4, there's two main bandwidths that you will operate on within Wi-Fi. You have the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5.725, although they're just called five gigahertz for short. <clears throat> and these are the ranges in which your Wi-Fi can operate. Within each of these bands, there are specific frequencies, also called channels, at which the wire de wireless devices can operate. In order to avoid interference with nearby wireless access points, you need to find channels that don't overlap. There are significantly more channels within the five gigahertz bandwidth and you're allowed to do things like channel bonding. So they don't really focus on that as heavily. They do heavily focus on the 2.4 gigahertz. And there are three main channels that you can use that guarantee no overlap. Those channels are one, six, and 11. That means there is no overlap. If you, if you adhere to those, most uh, wireless routers will automatically opt for one of these three. Yes, this is absolutely on the A+. You will see this question, if not a couple times. If I, you know, so each of these loops is the channel breadth. So if I have a channel one and a channel two, there is a whole lot of overlap between those channels. So we will get distortion, we will get static, it won't be as clean. 
we need to skip over until we hit six. And that gives us a little bit of a gap between the signals. So there is no crosstalk. It gives us the gap. Same thing happens with 11. Gives us a little bit more of a gap. Don't be that person in your, if you're in an apartment complex that picks channel eight. You literally eat up two different channel bandwidths. Your neighbors will strongly dislike it. If you don't like your neighbors, maybe go ahead and do it. I mean, it's, a, it's an easy way to mess with them. But, um, you know, that is why they typically stick to these three. And the thing is, is if you stick to these three, even with three-dimensional mapping, you can, you can continuously map on those three without having heavy interference. So like, you know, when you're dealing with buildings, you know, it's not just everybody who's next to you, you got the people above you and below you too. So there's a lot that goes on between uh, the various levels when you're dealing with setting up Wi-Fi networks. It's not just plug it in and be like, woohoo, it walk away. I mean, you actually got to map this stuff out, set it up so that it works seamlessly and you're not getting interference or causing interference to your neighbors. Oof, Wi-Fi characteristics. This is all important. So we had the first iteration, which is 802.11a. This support speeds up to 54 megabits per second. Pretty impressive out of the gate. It operates on the five gigahertz bandwidth. Next to the party, we had 802.11b, which supports speeds up to 11 meg megabits per second and uses the 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth. You might be asking yourself, why on earth did the speeds go down from generation one to generation two? Why is B slower than A? Well, the answer is these standards are assigned based on when the applications are made, not when they come to market. B came in second, but was first to market. B was actually hands down far more popular than A. That's when you first started, you know, seeing it being set up. B was the most popular, it was used the heaviest. So then we move into our next generation, which was 802.11G, which now support speeds up to 54 megabits per second, the same as A. And it operated off of the 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth. And oh, what a wonderful thing. It is backwards compatible with 802.11b. So if you have a bunch of 802.11b devices around, you can still upgrade your Wi-Fi. And it would still work with one really big caveat. If you have a network for like 802.11g and you introduce just one 802.11b device to that network, that entire network has to slow down to the 802.11b standard because we all have to be talking the same speed, same language, right? So backwards compatibility, yes, but if you introduce a lower level device, everything bottlenecks and slows down so that that one device can communicate. So the key takeaway for G, backwards compatible with B, still operating off of that 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth. Questions so far? <clears throat> Remember, I told you when I came in, I wrote down all my port numbers every every morning or every day around lunch. The other thing I wrote down, one of the one of the other things I wrote down, my wireless standards too. I believe there is a slide at the end that kind of encapsulates all the change, all the differences between them. All right, next. We have the 802.11N, as in Nancy. 
This one allowed for us to operate in the 2.4 and the five gigahertz bands, both simultaneously, and it still is backwards compatible. It, is, it achieves a superior throughput through the use of multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO. It's the using multiple antennas for trans transmission and reception. You'll recognize the dawning of this particular um, standard by the routers that looked like little spiders that had a whole bunch of antennas sticking up from them. That's when this particular generation was starting to be implemented. And definitely want to remember, MIMO, multiple input, multiple output associated with 802.11n. On the five gigahertz band, they were allowed to, or it started to implement channel bonding, which is where you group multiple channels together to operate as a single wood, allowing for much higher throughput on an individual band. Had much higher speeds than its predecessors, giving you up to 130 to 150 megabits per second. Understand that that is the shared bandwidth. That is not each individual unit on that router. That is the shared bandwidth. So the more people you have, the more that bandwidth gets cut up and divided. So one, 130 to 150 is the maximum achievable bandwidth you could have over 802.11 in. And next we have 802.11 AC, which is strictly on the five gigahertz. Awesome. Okay, back to that in. Remember both 2.4 and 5. 802.11c, back to strictly 5 gigahertz. It's the only technology that can use wider channels in the 5 gigahertz band, allows for the most spatial streams, and can bond up to eight channels. And this one also allows for multiple user MIMO, which allows for speeds as high as one gigabit per second, which is really nice on Wi Fi. So any questions on Wi-Fi? Those are the main standards you need to know for the A+. Yes, DW. <clears throat> for the 802.a1ac, is the one gigabyte uh, max speed, is that for the network? Or the or device on the network. Well, that's going to be your total bandwidth for the device. So same thing as in with. So the if you have two, device. your maximum could be like you know half a gig per you know five hundred megabits per second each. Okay. But that but that's your total bandwidth for the network for the entire network. I want right? For that router, what it can handle. Right. For that, for that wireless. For the wire for that for that for that WLAN right because you're probably using yeah. that one router for that yeah. WLAN. Which that's a lot of bandwidth. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's, you know, even if you have five, 10 devices on there, that's still a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. Under current standards. Granted, as things develop, like as we're using more virtual reality and a lot more information needs to be transmitted in order for things to function, that gets eaten up pretty quickly. Because it used to be six megabits per seconds was freaking awesome for internet but then we started getting into hd versus standard definition and all that stuff and like that just went by the wayside because there was just so much more data that needed to be transmitted in order for it to be able to keep up and i actually had a question earlier but um i didn't bring it up about the uh the satellite you know how you said uh signals were bounced up into the satellite that come back down did they ever mm -hmm. Because you know you said that weather would interfere, or you know yes. weather foliage and those kind of things interfere with it. Did they, did they ever try to implement like a laser communication like that way, and or was that just even worse for interference? Uh, it's not necessarily. I mean, the laser would you would see um, attenuation through clouds and stuff like that, which is why with fiber optics they have it contained and and isolated in that cladding. But I know for things like if they're communicating like you know, sending transmissions back and forth to the moon and a lot of that stuff, a lot of times they will actually use laser for communication. Uh, you can't do it, I don't think, with Mars. Of course, Mars takes what, like 
20 to 40 minutes for a signal to, to get there, but they use radio transmitters for that, long range radio transmitters. But I think for things like the moon, they can use laser. It's just not practical because if you're off by one one thousandth of a degree, you'll miss your target. <laughs> Where a satellite is a lot more forgiving because it has a cone shaped signal. All right, ad hoc mode. This is a wonderful wireless standard that can be used for peer to peer communications between from one computer to another, each wireless node in direct contact with the other. They're suited for small groups of computers, you know, three or four, transfer files, share printers, things like that, usually through Bluetooth. I will say this ad hoc poses an insane security risk. If you are not using it, this needs to be turned off on your computer. Because what can happen is somebody can park next to you, connect to your machine through ad hoc, and then operate through your internet as if they were you. So if you're working through your company or something like that, you have essentially granted them access and privilege through your connection. And they gained access to you through your ad hoc community, your ad hoc mode being turned on. This is something you only turn it on when you're using it. As soon as you're done, you turn it off. All right, infrastructure mode. Networks that use one or more wireless access points to connect wireless nodes together over a Wired, net, wired network segment. So infrastructure mode is better suited to networks that need to share dedicated resources such as internet connections. How this works is, is like if you're setting up a wireless mesh network where you're setting up multiple access points, you would have one which would be the primary. And when you are pushing information to the other, say if you're changing the network name and password, the SSID and the passphrase, you would change it on the, the primary device and it would distribute that information out to the other access points. So you don't need to go through and change every access point. You only need to change the primary one. And that primary one is typically where the bridge is happening between the wireless network and your wired internet. On to wireless encryption type security. First iteration, you have WEP or wired equivalent privacy, because prior to this, everything was just sent open text. It was just all out there. If you had a wireless uh, antenna set on or a wireless router or NIC, you could set it on promiscuous mode download everything you pick up free program on the internet called wireshark if you're going to get into security it's a real good one to start playing around with and it basically turns your wireless nick into a receiver and will pull down all packets that it, it sees and you can see the amount of information that's being transmitted around you and you can actually dissect the packets if they're not using uh encryption but WEP, one of the first ones they put into place, wired equivalent privacy, uh, configures a static, meaning it does not change, 40 to 104 bit WEP key. So if you want to associate with a particular WAP or wireless access point, you need to be configured with an identical key in order to be able to communicate with that wireless access point through WEP. And it creates an encryption base off of that. It is a fully cracked security protocol. It is virtually useless. Any uh, hacker with a modicum of training can crack this in less than two to three minutes. Due to the nature of static keys, as they are not changing over time, it is very, very quick 
to overcome that particular algorithm. I will say it's better than nothing. Because at least the person has to have some technical knowledge to bypass it versus just being able to receive it and see it. So, but yeah, typical hacker, two to three minutes, they have bypassed this particular encryption level. So that being said, we had to move on to WPA, which is a dynamic key encryption. So the key, new key is generated for each packet that is sent over the internet. It requires the user to be authenticated before keys are exchanged. Now, we don't need to get too heavily involved, but there are keys with regards to encrypting and decrypting things. You have to think about it as a box. If I use, the box has two keys. If I use one key to lock the box, only the other key can unlock that box. In every computer, you have what is called a public and a private key. The private key is associated specifically with that computer. It is not shared with anyone. It only is associated with that computer. You have a public key, which is what you would hand out to somebody in order for them to be able to decrypt your messages. So you would do what is called a key exchange through authentication. So when you authenticate, I know DW is who he says he is. Here is my public key. I will now transmit my message to you and then you can use that public key to decrypt my message. With this, uh, it also uses Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, or TKIP, for enhanced encryption. That is the use of the private public key system with regards to encrypting and decrypting of data. TKIP, associate that immediately with WPA. Temporal, meaning time. You know, everything is based off of this key will be good for X amount of time. So temporal key integrated protocol or integrity protocol. Keys are issued as an integrity check to verify they have not been modified or tampered with during transit. And only particular implements of the provision of 802.11i security standard. Or only partially implements the new provisions for security, excuse me. Question. This is considered to be slightly better than WEP. This in itself was kind of a bridging technology to get us to WPA2, which utilizes the advanced encryption standard and it is a 128-bit block cipher that is far tougher to crack than either of the previous iterations. Whenever possible, of the three, this is the one you want to use. Now, here's the thing. When you're looking at your Wi-Fi router, and if it says WPA2 TKIP, that's just WPA. And if they say WPA with AES, that's WPA2 but they don't want to confuse you sometimes. So they will utilize the advanced encryption standard or the TKIP to kind of, because people are going to go for the highest level they can get. So they will go for the WPA too. And then it'll say with TKIP, which means it's just WPA. Now, when using a centralized server for authentication, users, <clears throat> user is referred to as enterprise mode. One of these standards that you may hear about would be Kerberos. They talk about it in the book. You don't need to know a lot about Kerberos. It's just more of a definitional sense if you get into, when you get into security and networking, they'll talk more about that kind of stuff. They'll get far more in detail about this. So when using a configured password or pre-shared key, PSK, pre-shared key, instead of a centralized server, it is referred to as personal mode. 
So if you're using a centralized server like Kerberos, where it's something you would farm out, that is enterprise. When you're using the pre-shared key method, similar to what we were talking about with key exchange, that is personal. That is a direct communication between you and someone else. And it is the strongest encryption type at this time. With regards to A plus. Questions, comments, concerns. Here is just kind of a full review of everything. I think there's a better uh, slide later in the show that just kind of, it's a lot simpler, uh, but this kind of just sums up everything that we had on this one. All right. The role of the router. Primary role essentially is to allow communication between the networks through the controlling of the flow of data. Operates, as, operates off of layer three of the OSI model and it communicates and reads IP addresses and routes packets between sub networks by making forwarding decisions based upon routing tables that have been created <clears throat> communicating between itself and its neighbors. So routers tend to communicate with all routers directly linked to them and they essentially set up routing tables based off of that. They will forward information through them. It allows home users to share cable or DSL internet. And this is where Routers are used extensively over the internet to transfer packets across. So every router that you have that is hooked up to the, the internet becomes a piece of that infrastructure and will receive and forward data based off of the routing tables. And it may, and it may have nothing to do with you. It's just literally as it receives, it's able to forward it on. Once it becomes connected, it becomes part of that network. And both wired and wireless models are available. Now, this one here on the left, this is your typical, although extremely old, uh, home router. They don't look like this much anymore. <clears throat> and then off to the right, you would see what it looks like for an, a network or an enterprise level router. It is far more robust, far more specific in what it does. All right, now you have your WAPS or wireless access point. Many of them look like these flat little disks. You might be walking around in public buildings and see them installed up in the roofs so they can get very clear signals. Uh, these kind of operate similarly in the way that a hub does on a wired ethernet. Many WAPS also act as switches and internet routers. Much like we were saying on a hub, remember I was saying that only one can, computer can talk at a time on a hub. Otherwise, there's what's called data collision. And whenever that, those collisions happen, everybody backs off. And then there's like a random number generator that, you know, so many you know, milliseconds go by and then they would talk. But the number, random number generator, it's usually not the same time. So then it will talk. The other computer will sense something in the line and not talk. So that is that CSMACD, the CD standing for collision detection. On a, wire, a wireless network, same problem, only a single device can talk at a time on any wireless network. Otherwise, there's a data collision. They use something that's slightly different where they will listen first and then speak. And that is CSMA slash CA, which is collision avoidance.
So I know it, it may seem like you have multiple devices on a wireless network, and it seems like they're all kind of doing everything at once, but no, they're actually taking turns because only one can communicate at a time. Unless you get the MIMO going and then you have multiple antennas where they can communicate. Now, running all these wireless access points through the ceilings, this stuff needs power, right? I mean, everything runs off electricity. Do we really wanna be running power lines through our ceiling too? on top of the internet lines that we got to run? That gets to be a lot. So as electricity basically just runs through copper wire, they figured out a way to actually run electricity through our data lines, which is a technology called POE, Power Over Ethernet. So this allows us to supply power to these wireless access points that are up in the ceiling and crawl spaces and stuff like that without having to run actual power lines to them. We would use what's called a PoE injector, which would essentially provide, you know, push electricity into these data lines and push it over to each of these devices, providing them with enough power to be able to operate. Pretty neat technology. Equally as neat and not notated here is EOP, which is the opposite of this. It is ethernet over power, where you can use the existing power lines in your house or apartment or what have you and run data over them because it's just copper wires, right? So if you live in an apartment where you have horrible Wi-Fi because you have so many neighbors around you and you have at least two, one says, ha ha, putting mine on channel eight. Another one says, yeah, I got you. I put mine on four. And then you get no really good Wi-Fi signals. You can actually establish Ethernet over power. Uh, they call it power line. And you can run that data over the, the power lines and have actually the strength and stability of a wired connection. It's actually just slightly lower than a wired connection without having to run new data lines through your house. You literally plug one into one outlet, you plug one into another outlet, you sync them up, and they create a stable connection between the two. Absolutely amazing technology. Early iterations of it weren't so fantastic, but now they're able to filter out a lot of the uh, interference and they work very well. All right. questions so far. Oh, I did run us a little long, didn't I? Yeah, it's going to do a five minute, well, let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back at five after three. I'll pause the recording here. Thank you for the reminder. Continuing on, on our Soho router journey. We mentioned early on in the presentation, SOHO stands for Small Office or Home Office Router. These are typically the smaller multifunction routers, and it stands between the network, your internal network, and the internet itself. We kind of recently let you guys know it was a multifunction device, so router is kind of a misnomer. Uh, it is a router. It's also a switch, a gateway, a bridge a DHCP server, because it provides any new um, members of the um, network with an IP address and things of that nature. It also is a wireless access, access point. And, um, pardon me. I had an, I had an adventurous four-year-old trying to escape. Um, and it also does perform some firewall services and network address translation, where it translates the internal IP to the external IP. So 
quick steps for installing your router, planning, physical insta installation, like planning, where are we gonna put this thing? Where can I get the best range out of this device for my entire household or office or what have you? Typically it is a centralized location. Physical installation, it's usually just plug in the power, plug in your ethernet and you're off to the races. And then we go to configuration. So basic configuration you need to set on your router would be your channel. Are you gonna be operate off of what, what channels do we operate off of wirelessly? Here we go, one, six, and 11. Job, Hunter. Network address translation creates a unique opportunity to assist in the security of a network. You can create your own range of IP addresses that you wanna use within your own network. There's the typically acceptable ones, but you can set up whichever ones you want. Typically, you stick within the private uh, IP ranges, though. Many of them have universal plug and pray, or excuse me, plug and play, Freudian slip, and additional services that you can apply to these firewalls, to these uh, routers, are firewalls where you can use ACLs to block unwanted traffic and uh, can be physical or software. And then something we haven't talked about before, which is quality of service, which are strategies that are used to manage the flow of network traffic. Now, the, if you have high traffic in your network, ways that you can make things run more efficiently, the highest value types of communications can be prioritized within your network. If you're doing things like what we do here, Zoom and stuff like that, where we have to use it for learning and for conferencing and business, you know, all of our business models, that's going to be very high priority because we're wanting to make sure we don't have a lot of pixelation. We don't have a lot of uh, delays or drops or things like that. So we will set this as the highest priority. Now, sending an email, well, it's okay if an email takes, you know, a few seconds, half a minute or whatever, what have you to get to its destination. So that would be considered a best effort or a low priority. Quality of service allows us to set the priorities for the different types of traffic and how they will be pushed through the network. What gets first priority? What is best effort or lowest priority? Depending on the fluctuations of the internet traffic at that time. So installing our router. First, locate the router on the central uh, centered location where the wireless signal can cover most of your surface area. Connect the AC power, connect the network cables if needed. Start up a PC and connect to the router using a browser per the manufacturer's instructions. Here's the thing. If you run IP config on your computer, the IP address for your gateway that's your router. That is how you're going to connect to your router. And then you'll be able to sign in and do fun configurations. I need to see a quick raise of hands. How many people have actively gone into their router that their internet service provider gave them, changed the SSID and password to the router, not, or excuse me, the, the sign-in and password to the router, not the SSID and password to your Wi-Fi. Those are two different things. Change the password and sign into your router administrator so that people can't go in and actually mess with the settings on your router. How many people have actually done this? So we have like two. Not, not your Wi-Fi sign-in and password, your router administrator sign-in and password. So this is your homework for the week. If you have not done this, you're gonna go to an internet browser, be it Google or what have you, after you've done your IP config and get your gateway address. So you know what your gateway is, that is your home router. Then you're gonna punch in that IP address into your web browser, and it's going to take you to your router. You need to go in. You can go over and look at your security settings to see what they're set to. You can kind of 
look around in there if you want. But change your administrator password and sign in so that it, your router and your network for your house is not wide open for anybody to go in and change things. If you don't know the password, it usually is, you can look it up online. If you're Xfinity, this stuff is readily available out there. It's, it's scary. You just go out there and just say, like, if you're with Xfinity, just say Xfinity uh, basic administrator sign in and password. And it'll tell you, it'll be like admin and then PSSWD or, or PASSWD in lowercase. And that'll get you right into your router. And then you need to change it and update those sign ins and passwords. We'll talk about the instructions when we're done with this again real quick. But yeah, that'll be your homework. Go in and make your own networks more secure. So you start up a PC. Once you punched in that IP address, that'll take you into your router. You can then sign into your router, give it a unique administrator name and password. And then you can configure your settings and update the firmware as necessary. All right, SSID for your wireless network, that is your service set identifier, which is what uniquely identifies your wireless network from everyone else's. So that is your network name for your Wi-Fi or SSID, service set identifier. WAPs are usually configured to announce their presence to everybody else saying, hey, this network is here. This is network is here. This is our name, all that stuff, which is why when you're looking for wireless networks, it'll give you a list of them. It is because it is broadcasting that SSID out there to their maximum range. They do have an option to not do this. For some reason, they actually consider this a security protocol. Anybody with a Wi-Fi antenna, though, can bypass this with no problem whatsoever. So is it a, a security protocol? Kind of, but not really. For the purposes of the A+, they would consider it a security protocol. Users who are not authorized to access the network will have a hard time knowing the network is there as it won't show up in the list of nearby networks for most devices. Questions so far? All right. Channel configuration, wireless routers can be used on different channels as we talked about early. 2.4 gigahertz goes between channels one through 11. 1, 6, and 11 are the commonly used in the United States to avoid interference with other networks. The channel change may be, is made only on the router because each client should automatically detect and change to the new channel. Most SOHO routers will automatically decide which channel to use depending on the other channels it detects in the area. Questions? All right, here's another so-called security measure called Mac filtering. Since every device has a unique Mac address, remember you have the, what is it? You have the six groups of two, characters, hexadecimal, the first three go for the manufacturer, second three go for the device itself. So utilizing this MAC address, we can actually tell our routers to only allow the specified MAC addresses of the devices on our network. So if you have only a few devices that you have on your network and you only want to allow those devices, you can input the approved MAC addresses into a list and say, I want to employ Mac filtering and it will only allow those devices through. 
It's not efficient in large scale because you do not want to be putting in the MAC addresses for hundreds of computers into a list. This would be only usable for very small networks. In real life, however, it is real easy to spoof a MAC address. You can literally do this by just creating a virtual machine on your computer and it will ask you if you want to manually input a MAC address. You have just spoofed a MAC address. And if you know the MAC address of a device that is on that network, you can bypass MAC filtering. So in practice, it is called a security measure in, or excuse me, in, in theory, it is called a security measure in practice, not so much. So for the purposes of the A+, this is considered a security measure. Wi-Fi protected setup. Please, for the love of everything, turn this off. This is a fully cracked protocol. Even if you do not initiate it, somebody can initiate it remotely to get into your networks. There are only so many keys. Yes, it is so nice and easy, that friendly little button, you just push it and then you push it on your device and they magically talk to each other. And all is right with the world and amazing things begin to happen. But unfortunately, it is one of the largest security holes in many networks because if you have a WPS device, the WPS is active, somebody can remotely activate it and access your networks. For the purposes of the A+, this is an easy way to pair devices <laughs> and get them onto your network. But understand in reality, this is a fully cracked protocol on Wi-Fi routers and things like that. They have a section where you can go in and turn this off. Same with printers and other things. You can go in and manually turn off this protocol so it does not function. I highly encourage you to do this with any device on your network that has this enabled. It's typically within the settings uh, of your router, as well as it would be in the settings of a printer if you have it, things like that. So when you go into the router, when I give you the instructions at the end to get back to get into your router to change the administrative password and sign in, when you're in there, you look around and it should give you a function WPS and have a toggle button. Do you want it off or on? So this only works with WPA and WPA2. It does not work with WEP, which is the earlier security encryption protocols. It simplifies the security configuration of a SOHO router. Questions? Are we getting more paranoid yet? World, world is not so bright and fuzzy as it used to be. All right. DMZ or demilitarized zone of your network. This is an area to connect public servers that can be accessed from the outside of the network. However, external users won't have access to the internal network. So by keeping the rest of the network from being visible to external users, the threat of intrusion drops significantly. I'll kind of show you what this looks like. This is a very rudimentary uh, explanation of it. So you have, you know, you have the cloud. Here we go. There's our internet. Wire comes down, you have your typical external firewalls come in and then you branch off and say you have your email and your web servers. 
and then you would have another stronger firewall and then you would have your internal network your internet so what this may be so you have two firewalls this one is not going to be as severe and then this one will be much more extreme now anything that you would want people to access from the outside be it like email for you know sales staff or employees working remotely things like that they would have a way through the firewall to access this for your web service you know for your business if you're advertising or selling things or any of that kind of stuff uh, you would have that in this area this area between the firewalls is called the dmz or demilitarized zone this will allow you to protect your internal accounting, HR, research and development, all that kind of fun stuff behind a much more robust firewall while still allowing access to outside people to resources that you want to be able to see with regards to your business. So the area between the two, again, the DMZ. Yes, Jessica. So what you drew is like a picture of the, like you said, the internet, mm -hmm. where once we are starting to reach outside the internet, that midsection between the web browser and the email, the DMZ is like our, is like the protection, the protector. And he's like, wait, you guys are about to go outside. Let me be your coat to protect you from the world. You know what I mean? Because it doesn't want. Well, least, here's the thing I is if you, what I was if you have anything out there with zero protection on it, it's going to get torn apart in a matter of days. Because viruses, malware, all that stuff, it's going to get torn apart in a matter of days if there's no protection on it whatsoever. So you do have this initial firewall that will operate off of more passive um, protocols. And then behind that is where you will have the stuff that would be okay to be visible by the outside. So you have your email servers, web servers, typically things like that. And then your stuff that is sensitive that you don't want anybody outside having access to, like I said, research and development, accounting, uh, HR with all the you know personally identifiable information. If you're a hospital, all the hospital records, all that stuff would be behind this That's major true. firewall. Okay. So you've created a little buffer zone in between you and the outside net where you would have less sensitive stuff to be able to be accessed. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Typically the rule on a personal router, like at your house, don't put things in the DMZ. Cause if you do, it's putting it beyond your firewall and it's gonna get hacked apart because you don't have that secondary firewall. So in an enterprise situation, this is typically when you would set up a DMC. Yes, Darwin. No, I was just gonna give a example of how I, how I kind of like rationalize it. So basically imagine that you have kids and you want them to play outside, but you don't want them outside in the street where they can cross the street. So you let them play in the yard which, you know, but they can't play in the house because you want to protect the house from whatever they're doing. So they can yeah. play outside, right? But they, they, they're they not going to be able to go out into, uh, into the street or into the yard. So it's like a buffer in between the real outside. Well, I, I, if we expand upon that a little bit, it might make a little more sense. Like your kids internally can go out to the yard and play in the yard. They can invite other neighborhood kids to come play in your yard too. But your kids, you don't want them going out in the street and you don't want the neighborhood kids coming into the house. So you've created an area where they can kind of intermingle. That, that's even better, yeah, exactly. So a neutral zone, essentially. Questions? You ready to tap out yet?
I am. I've been talking all day, man. I'm tired. All right. Next. Kelly, I had my hand up. Oh, you did? Yeah. What's up? So I have a question. So if let's say you bought like the router at home, let's say, and I bought like a specialized, just dedicated like firewall, right? Mm -hmm. So not only do I have the firewall for my ISP, but I also have my personal firewall. Where exactly is it? Is like the DMD? Is there something that I? Is there an actual physical device that I can get? Well, the DMZ would be okay. So like the drawing I just showed you, where you had the. Uh, eh. It's gonna be a lot rougher. So you got you got the internet comes in. You got your firewall coming in branches off you got your email and web another firewall and then you got your internals so it's from the by circle so your internal so think of this like this line is the internet the wire coming in from the outside hitting that first firewall so there would be a physical device here this would be your your, your hardware firewall would be the break between the external and the internal. It is in line. And then you would have the wires come in and connect to your internal servers. You could do all of this part of it in a server room. And then, uh, so you would have these, and then there would be in between these devices and the internal, there would be another physical device, which would be your other firewall and then it would come into your internal networks. So where you would have your demarcation point, you'd have that immediately connect into a firewall, have that wired through your email and web servers, and then you would have connections between that and go through your internal firewall, and then your rest of your network would be wired. So yes, this is also a physical diagram of how you would set things up. So the DMZ is just part of the actual, like the first, like you can just have that set up in the first uh, firewall it, or, or, you know what I mean? Like, cause I know you, you had mentioned it, it's like up, outside, to, like mm -hmm. on the peripheral. So I was trying to figure out like what exactly what it was, if it's an actual device, or it's actually it, it part. Well, of the DMZ it. itself is not a device. It's a space you've created between two security points. Okay, got it, okay. So like, think about like uh, the separation between North and North and South Korea, they have the DMZ, which is that, that kind of no man's land in between the two, creates that buffer between the North and the South. Okay. That's essentially what you're doing is you're creating a buffer between the, you know, the outside internet and your internal one, but there's an area where there's a little bit of communication possible. Any other questions? All right, so other features that kind of coincide inside that router itself, you have the DHCP or dynamic host configuration protocol, which is how you would distribute your IP addresses. Initially, this is set up automatically, but you can reconfigure it yourself to do what you want it to do. You can set static IPs for your printers in your house, or if you have network attached storage or something like that, where you want to have a static address that everything always knows where to go to communicate with it, security cameras, things like that. You can establish that through your DHCP. And then uh, you can have, you know, as guests come over and you give them access to your network, maybe they're assigned a IP address for, you know, a couple of days or a week or what have you. You're not typically gonna run out of IP addresses at your house depending on the number of parties you throw, but you know it allows you to internally configure them as you wish. The network address translation does all that fun magic between the internal and the external IPs so that you can communicate externally. We've already discussed about quality of service and universal plug and pray. Most devices when you hook up to it already understand the protocols and are able to communicate right off the bat.
I'm not sure what he was singing there, Julian. He's been really fond of 12 Days of Christmas this year. So I, I, we're just happy when he talks, honestly. Yes, he really loves five golden rings. He will scream that at the top of his lungs. All right. So important extra network security, port filtering <laughs> and port forwarding. He uses to open or close certain ports so that certain protocols cannot be accessed by outside protocols. You also have things called port forwarding is when the firewall receives a individual request coming into your network, specifying a specific port, that port can be triggered to go to a specific device on the network. So if you're not at your house and you want to check your security cameras, you can set up port forwarding where you would plug in the IP address to your house and then the specific port, that port would trigger that individual device so you'd be able to look at that security camera. If you actually are serious about your security, then you would not be using stuff like Ring and stuff like that, that because you're, you're allowing third party companies and stuff like that to have full access to all of your security. They have devices that you can configure yourself that you would control 100% and you can access outside through the use of port forwarding. <laughs> There's also something we'll talk about called port triggering. Uh, which is when one port is activated, it, in, when you communicate through one port, it automatically activates another port. This is very common with the use of FTP protocols, because remember we said FTP operates off of 20 and 21. That's typically because your outbound communications on FTP go out on 20 and come back on 21. You remember when we talked about using the firewalls, if they're in a passive state, it pays attention to the communication. So if it feels that another protocol is being triggered from a response, it will typically block that. But port triggering would allow me to communicate out on 20. And once it goes out on 20, it will open 21 to allow the response to come back. So that is port triggering. Port forwarding allows you to punch in a specific port to go communicate with an individual device within the network. See, most of your uh, PTZ cameras, pan, tilt, zoom, um, the way to access them would be through port 80, which is your HTTP port. Well, if you're not running a web server on your house, you don't want to have port 80 open on your house because that will allow people to kind of come in. It gives them a back door. So you could set it to some random port. It could be port 43,562. And that would be like your back door, your, your backyard camera. So when you have that port triggered by you coming in, it instantly goes to that camera and then you're able to uh, view what is going on through that camera. The camera will view it as if you're coming in through port 80, that's the forwarding part of it, but external actors would not be able to gain access to it through the web service portal. Questions? You don't need to know in-depth information with regards to port forwarding, filtering, or triggering. It's mostly just definitional understanding of what's happening. All right, virtual private network, VPN. We have talked about this quite a bit. This creates a tunneled encryption that you would push your data through, making it very, very difficult for people to basically glean your data while it's in transit. And then it gets to a server where it goes into their network, things get reconfigured, you pop out somewhere else on their network with a completely new IP address and things like that. And then you're communicating as if you're somewhere else. It makes it very difficult for people to track your data, track what you're doing. Uh, it is becoming more of a necessity in today's life rather than a luxury. Um, it allows for regional uh, shielding where you can kind of hide 
you know, where you are located. If you want to see, you know, if you want to watch anime, you know, you can watch it. You go to Korea, you can act like your network is in Korea. You get to, you get access to a lot more anime on Netflix. If you go to Canada, you get access to a lot different shows on Netflix. You know, it allows for, you know, things that are regionally shielded to be unlocked for that purpose. All right. And it sets up an encryption tunnel over your existing network. Although you do have to be careful of the VPNs you use because not all of them are created equal. Much like, you know, many things out there, if it is a free anti-malware or a free VPN, be skeptical, do your research heavily. VPNs, you can have what's called a whole tunnel or a half tunnel because there's a lot of processing power that goes into it. Whole tunnel means both ways of your communication are encrypted. Half tunnel means only one direction is, is encrypted. So these are things you need to pay attention to when signing up for VPNs and who you would trust with your data. Questions? All right. Any, any issues while installing your routers, re refer to the documentation for the most part, because the, the, the instructions that they give you at the router will give you a pretty good layout, how to access the router, where to find certain settings, things like that. SSID and password for the router should be changed away from defaults because you, want, you don't want your network being open and vulnerable. Use your, if you're not able to connect to internet websites, try pinging a known address. The most common one people like to ping is 8.8.8.8, which is Google's DNS server. It is the most famous DNS server in the world because it is always up and running with the exception of the most recent uh, denial of service attack that they underwent. But if your web addresses aren't working, you ping a known IP address, and that'll tell you if you have a problem with your DNS, in which case you might have input the DNS uh, address incorrectly, and you just need to correct that. Or if you can't access the website through typing in the FQDN or the IP address, then it means you actually don't have access to the internet. So you need to understand where the problem is occurring. So verify the internet is connected and has activity lights. So we know that data is actually being transmitted. Use the command prompt to get your IP config space forward slash all to verify all of your settings. That's one thing I would like everybody to try to do tonight. And verify TCPA settings through the local area connection properties in the Windows setup like we showed earlier in this presentation. You can change it to dynamic, from dynamic to static if you wish uh, to assign information automatic or Manually, you can do this. Sometimes you can change it away and then come back to dynamic and it will re-request all that information and that may clear it up because if two people are on the network with the same IP, you will have internet intermittent communication issues. And that usually means one of them input the information statically, one of them is getting them dynamically and you have that crossover. All right. Other common connecti connectivity issues. Verify your device manager recognizes the adapter without errors. If errors occur, it could be the drivers on your network card. There are no errors. Open network sharing center and a red, a red X is located between the device indicates a problem. Click the X to start Windows Network Diagnostics and Troubleshooting Program. I believe somebody had this very problem over the weekend. When you check your IP address, see if you have an APIPA and link local address assigned. If you have your APIPA, what does APIPA start with? Automatic. Well, yeah, it does start with automatic, but what does the IP, the APIPA address start with? 169. 169, there you go. So if you see a 169 address as your IP address, you got problems. It means you're not talking to the DHCP server. Or there was address conflict. Sometimes this, you know, 
requires you turning off that connection, reestablishing that connection, and you can get past that. Also try pinging your gateway. Uh, limited or local connectivity, other issues. And that's these are as ways to determine whether or not you're using an APIPA. And intermittent connectivity is usually two or more people with the same IP address. Common wireless issues, most common, the Wi-Fi adapter is turned off on the computer. It's a toggle switch on laptops most of the time. And on desktops, it's usually an icon on Macs. I know it is in the upper right. In Windows, it is in the bottom left. In your network settings, you can toggle this on and off depending on your needs. Also, it could be your router is placed in an area that has RF interference with using some channels. Also, the more walls you have to pass through, the more attenuation you're going to experience. Also, the type of wall. Is it brick? Is it drywall? If it's drywall, do you have metal studs? These are things that can affect the signal passing through. Uh, you can place it in a higher position for better access. And the router channels can be changed if you're in an apartment to minimize the interference from other Wi-Fi routers around you. Other things could be you're entering the wrong access key for your network, so you the wrong password. And also, you may not be able to locate it because the SSID is not being broadcast. And then finally, if the signal is too weak, you'll have intermittent issues because the device is too far from the router and the signal is either too weak or getting lost, in which case you either move the router or you move yourself or add another device. Those are your three options with that one. All right. So, let's see here. When you're checking for connectivity, we haven't got into uh, command line too much, but you basically start as close to home as possible and you start pinging out systematically. Ping is a very powerful troubleshooting tool. So you would start first ping yourself, 127. Then you would, you would ping your default gateway, which is your router. If those both come back good, then you would ping a known website, i.e. google.com, which is the 8.8.8.8. .8 this will let you know where the communication break is happening. Is it your NIC? Is it your gateway? Are you having problems with the DNS server where you're able to ping the website? by typing in www.google.com, but you cannot get to the same place at 8.8.8.8. So check for problems on your network adapter. You open up your device manager, make sure everything is okay there. Power cycle things, because it's amazing how often power cycling your router will correct or your computer can correct some of these issues. Check your physical connections. If you're not operating wirelessly, cables have two sides. Oh, Make sure both please. are working. Oh, Make sure a valid IP address is in place. You're not. Make sure you don't have an APIPA address. Also, the first time you get your IP configuration data for your network, write this stuff down so that you can know if something changes. You want to be familiar with your network. Stop. All right. Here is the slide I was talking about earlier where it kind of breaks down each of the uh, wireless standards, gives you kind of a, um, a breakdown of each specs. It doesn't give you the MIMO and all that stuff, but the years they're implemented, not so important. But the... Uh, the frequencies and the speeds are extremely important. If you continue on to networking, the typical range outdoors comes into play. But for A+, plus, frequency and max data are your main things. Remembering G is backwards compatible with 11. N, MIMO was, invent or was implemented. And AC was five gigahertz only.
So screenshot for sure. Did you still have a question, DW? Yeah, I'm just I'm making sure that I these are the, the generations, right? So starting from the left will be G1 all the way up to G5G. Well, Sorry, or no. It is the protocols. It's this one is more is more appropriate to say protocol than generation. Oh, okay. So I would say iteration, maybe, you know, but generation, not so much. So understanding your frequency and your throughputs on these various protocols under the 802.11 standards. Sorry, I get I get more finicky about being specific with our language the further along we go. So any other questions? All right. Now we should be able to compare and contrast internet connection, internet connection types, like our DSLs versus our fiber versus our uh, satellites, Wi-Fi. I know it seems like an eternity ago, but that actually did happen during this presentation. Um, compare and contrast Wi-Fi networking standards and encryption, or WEPs versus our WPA, WPA2, knowing that TKIP goes with WEP and AES goes with WPA2. Explain the role of a router and describe the differences between a wired and wireless router. Describe and install and configure, deploy SOHO routers, as well as some troubleshooting that we can do. Questions, 